Good morning. My name is Taylor Lewis and I am the Education Coordinator at the Edmonton Construction Association. We welcome you to the Construction Insurance 101 webinar. If you have any questions during the webinar, please type them in the chat box and we will make sure that they are answered. I now present to you Chris Way from Lloyd Sad. Thanks very much, Taylor. Good morning, everybody. Um, gonna start by sharing my screen here, just one second. Uh, so first off, I want to thank DCA for the opportunity to uh, put on this event. Uh, it's been something we've been talking about doing for a while and uh, really happy to be here and be doing this. This is our initial offering of this event, so uh, or this webinar, I should say. Really hoping that everybody um, takes away some, some stuff from this today and uh, also that there's some good questions and discussions. So as uh, Taylor said, if you guys have any questions, please use the Q&A feature and we will try to get those answered during the presentation or we'll have a question period at the end. I'll also share my contact information. If we don't happen to get to something today, then I can definitely um, answer those questions afterwards or you guys can feel free to reach out to me and uh, have any discussions on any of the stuff we talked about today. So I'll take a look at what we're going to be discussing here uh, today with this webinar. So first we're gonna talk about some project specific coverages. Um, course of construction policies, wrap up liability policies. These are used obviously very often. I'm sure everyone on this uh, call has either purchased one of these or, or been part of a project that have had these. So we're going to kind of get a little more in depth on what these things cover, um, how they're organized, some things that you should be considering when you're working on projects that, that have these on them. Uh, next, we're going to talk about some subcontractor considerations specifically. Um, when working on projects that have COCs and wrap-up policies. So we're going to talk about uh, what a difference in deductible policy is and when you might need that, some warranties, and also some potential for some savings on, um, on your commercial general liability for a subcontractor. We're going to touch briefly on a little bit of contract language. I won't spend too much time on this, but there's just a couple of things that uh, we, we see in contracts and everybody out there is probably seeing as well. Just kind of want to touch on what those things actually mean. Um, and then we're going to talk about just some construction specific coverages, um, not really related to a project specifically, but just a few things that are pertinent to a contractor um, that I just want to discuss some aspects of. So we'll start out by talking about the course of construction and the wrap up liability policy. So first and foremost, we want to understand and how these two policies function, what they are for. So basically a course of construction policy is a first party coverage. It covers the project that's being worked on, um, represented by the two big buildings in my, in my graphics here. And the wrap up liability policy is the third party coverage. So it's damage, bodily injury to you know, neighboring buildings, vehicles, people. So a lot of times I think those, those two get confused. I just wanna be very clear on, on what the two cover kind of as we move forward in, the, in discussing each of them. So what is actually covered by a COC? So a COC covers all the labor and materials, basically a cost to rebuild a project if that project um, is damaged by an insured peril. So we talk about what the insured perils are. I won't read all these off, but they're very similar to a property policy. You know, you might recognize a lot of these perils from that, and they are very similar. Now, you can purchase also some optional coverages when you get a COC, things like sewer backup, flood and earthquake, and equipment breakdown. Again, all very similar to probably what you've been seeing if you look through your property policy for your insurance. Um, there is also some additional coverages that are a little different when you purchase a COC. Depends on the insurer you're using, but you can get coverage for some additional things uh, such as temporary structures or property in transit, property at unnamed locations. Um, this can be important depending on how the job is structured. For instance, if you have kind of a staging area, you know, maybe there's a yard where some of the materials are being stored or in the event of the temporary structures, you know, work trailers that aren't incurred elsewhere. Definitely something that uh, should be considered when you're setting up your, your COC. So who buys a COC? Now, generally these are set up by the owner or in most cases, the general contractor. Um, and the benefits of the COC, the benefits of the COC is that there's adequate coverage for everyone working on that project. 
Now, when I say that, what I mean is, it, let's consider a scenario where a project's being done without a COC. You'd basically be relying on uh, everybody who's working on that project's installation floater, which I'll talk about an installation floater in a little more detail um, when we talk about some of the subcontractor considerations. But for our purposes right now, an installation floater is very similar to a COC, but it just pertains to the individual contractor's kind of scope of work rather than the project as a whole. So a COC, the benefit of putting that in place is it ensures that there's adequate coverage for that entire project, all of the subcontractors involved in that project and everybody's scope of work, um, rather than relying on the individual ones, which I'll talk a little bit more about. There's also less of an administrative burden. I'm sure everyone's familiar when, uh, when a project's taking place, you generally have to share a certificate of insurance with, again, the owner or the GC or whoever's kind of overseeing that aspect of the project. This is something that would still need to be done, but again, there's less concern with the individual insurance being provided by the subcontractors when there's a COC in place, because again, it provides that coverage for the project as a whole. And there's also less chance for litigation and subrogation. Uh, again, if a project's being um, undertaken and there's no COC in place, and this is similar with our wrap-up discussion, um, if something goes wrong on that project and there is damage and things need to be rebuilt and there's no COC, then again, we're relying on individual subcontractors insurance. And a lot of times what can happen there is we'll see, you know, there's, there needs to be a determination of who was responsible for a loss that can lead to lawsuits and, and downtime and insurance companies battling between each other. The COC really kind of eliminates that aspect as it provides coverage for everybody on that project for everything within the scope of the project. So if there is a loss generally handled pretty quickly, you know, there's none of the kind of infighting and kind of going back and forth between various subcontractors and their insurance companies. What is a wrap-up liability policy? So the best way to think of a wrap-up liability policy is it's very similar to the commercial general liability policy that you'll have in place. The difference being it's purchased for that project specifically. Now it covers everybody on that project, owner, GC, subcontractors, even the consultants, uh, excluding professional liability. So it really functions as a CGL policy for that project and everyone involved with it. So the coverages that you'll see on a wrap-up liability policy, very similar to your commercial general liability coverages. Um, main ones obviously being property damage and bodily injury. So if you refer to the first slide again, where I discuss kind of what a COC covers and what a wrap up covers, you can obviously think of claims instances, you know, if something were to happen where there was damage to a neighboring building or, you know, vehicle or, or a person, um, that's when this coverage would kick in um, rather than damage to the project itself from an insured peril, which would be covered under your COC. So wrap-ups are also generally um, organized or, or purchased by the owner or the general contractor. And the benefits are, are a lot of the same of a COC. It ensures that there's adequate coverage for everyone working on that project. And now, depending on the size and scope of a project, you can have many subcontractors involved. And these subcontractors can all carry commercial general liability at very different levels. Um, Five million has kind of become the new standard. Um, but I'm sure, you know, some people carry 1 million still or 2 million. Obviously, some people carry 10 or, or more, depending on the type of work that they're doing. Now, if a project kind of decides the owner or the general contractor that this project, you know, wants to have $10 million of coverage, purchasing a wrap-up liability policy essentially gives everybody on that project $10 million worth of liability coverage for the work taking place there. So, again, less of an administrative burden you know, with those certificates of insurance that uh, the GC is receiving or the owner, if somebody has less than that, you know, 10 million liability, let's say for argument's sake that they're looking for, the wrap-up liability really brings everybody up to that level. And then they're a little bit less concerned with what each individual is, is carrying. Same as a COC, there's less chance for litigation and subrogation. This policy is covering everybody. So, you know, whether or not uh, uh, one party was, was negligent and caused the damage over another is, is a little bit of an irrelevant point because the same policy is covering everyone much the same as the COC was. Another benefit of uh, working on a project that has wrap-up liability is there's also some cost savings um, if you're a subcontractor. I'll talk about that in a second here when uh, we talk about the specific considerations for subcontractors. 
that's something that you need to be discussing with your broker when you're when you're going through your renewals and making sure that they're aware if you're working on projects that do have wrap up liability policies. I can't see the chat right now, Taylor. So maybe I'll wait just a sec if there's any questions we wanted to touch on now or. I think we're all clear for right now. No chats in the or no questions in the chat at this point. So it's going well. Okay, sounds good. So I'll jump into the subcontractor considerations. So generally, when there is a COC and a wrap up liability policy on a project, we refer to it sometimes as the master policy. Now, as a subcontractor, I would strongly advise that you always get a copy of this master policy for any projects that you're on. Um, now, if you are working on that project, definitely within your rights to request that from a general contractor or an owner. Um, the main information that you're, you're going to want to be looking at is the deductibles and the warranties. So we're going to chat about both of those here briefly. So the main consideration with deductibles is that oftentimes on an insta or on a COC or a wrap up policy, the deductibles are much higher than you typically see with your installation floater or your CGL policy. So the reason this is done, and I'm, uh, you know, I'm sure everyone can relate to this from their own insurance policies, generally going with a higher deductible will provide some cost savings. So the main concern here for a subcontractor is, um, for example, let's say on your commercial general liability, you carry a deductible of $1,000. You're working on a project that has a wrap up liability policy, but the deductible on that project and that policy could be 10, 20, 50,000. In the event, uh, as I mentioned before, that there's a claim, it's being covered under that wrap up policy, but whoever is responsible for the damage in the event that it is somebody's negligence, you could still be held responsible for the deductible of that policy. Now, why that could be concerning, obviously, is, is if there is a high deductible set on the policy, um, you will have to pay that out of pocket. Now, what you can do is get a difference in deductible policy. Now, what this does is it basically allows you to pay the normal deductible that you would pay on your commercial general liability, and then the insurance policy, the difference in deductible, would pay the remainder up to whatever that project um, liability deductible is. So there's two ways of doing this. You can buy a difference in deductible policy on a project by project basis, or there is also some insurers that will offer this as part of your package or, or your commercial general liability policy. Now they can build in a limit there. Um, obviously you need to pick a limit that is high enough that would cover off all of your jobs kind of during that term. Um, but it is a, a bit of a nice way to do it and, and administratively less of a burden than going and purchasing a difference in deductible policy for every project that you might be working on. Another thing that subcontractors need to take into consideration are, are warranties. So oftentimes we'll see warranties on COC policies. Um, failure to adhere to the warranties can actually negate coverage. Um, so as a general contractor um, as well, but as a subcontractor, you want to make sure that you're reviewing the warranties for the project that you're working on and seeing if they're applicable to your scope of work and ensuring that you have, uh, you know, proper, um, properly kind of assess them and made sure that you're adhering to them. So some examples of warranties, you know, something simple like a hot work warranty. Um, the general wordings on these are, you know, if any hot work is being performed, maybe you have to you know, maintain supervision over that for 24 or 48 hours, um, a refuse waste and debris removal warranty, you know, generally describes kind of conditions of the work sites, where debris can be stored, you know, when, how often it has to be moved off the site. So oftentimes these are very simple little things, um, but they can be applicable to your scope of work. And, and again, going back to, you know, the whole purpose of having a COC policy or a wrap up is to kind of ensure coverage for that whole project. Um, but again, not adhering to something like that um, could actually negate the coverage that those policies are, are offering. Um, so as I said, for a GC and a subcontractor, definitely something that we want to be reviewing um, when we're getting policies for these projects. Uh, as I mentioned before, when there's a wrap-up liability policy in place, there can be an opportunity for a little bit of savings on your commercial general liability. So the reason for this is your commercial general liability, uh, as I'm sure everyone's aware, is, is generally rated based on your revenue. 
Um, so with that being said, if you're actually earning revenue um, from projects where there is a wrap up liability policy already in place, then that revenue should be removed from your commercial general liability calculation. So maybe I can give a little example to make sure that makes sense. Um, let's say you're a company that's, you know, making $1 million in revenue and, you know, that costs you $10,000 in, in liability insurance. Well, if you're actually performing half of that work, 500,000 on projects that have a wrap up liability policy, you're already being covered for the liability. So you would want to remove that revenue um, when you're doing your calculation of commercial general liability. So it would actually only represent 500,000 in revenue. So something that, um, you know, oftentimes actually people may or may not know as, as maybe as a small subcontractor, if a project has a COC or a wrap up liability policy. So it is something that you have to be aware of and, and look to find that out. Um, but then when you're doing your annual review with your insurance broker, definitely something that should be being addressed, uh, you know, how many of your projects are being covered under a wrap up liability policy and kind of doing that calculation to make sure that, um, you know, you're basically not paying for, for coverage that you've already had in place under a wrap-up. So talk about contract language. As I said, I'll just kind of touch on these briefly. Um, I, I feel today, you know, with contracts that we see, there, there's so much legal language and it's getting kind of more and more complex. Uh, I just wanted to touch on a couple of these that we see often um, in our kind of construction contracts and just touch on a little bit of what they actually mean and, and you know, what you're agreeing to when you are uh, having these in your contracts. So a hold harmless agreement, uh, also known as an indemnity agreement, it's a legal agreement that one party will not hold another liable for risk. Now these can be one way or they can be reciprocal. So I'm sure a lot of people have seen a, a hold harmless agreement kind of signed both ways. Um, for instance, between in favor of the GC to the subcontractor and vice versa. So this is just basically saying that, um, you know, on a project, if, if something happens, you, you can actually hold one of those other parties liable for that risk. Uh, waiver of subrogation, used to minimize lawsuits and claims between parties in a contract. Um, don't know if anyone's ever faced a situation before with subrogation, but basically the way subrogation takes place is if they determine that a party's at fault, um, you know, and their insurance company would have to pay this uh, a claim out for, for negligence or liability, oftentimes that insurance company will try to determine if there was another party, you know, that was also liable or partially negligent for that damage. And then they will try to subrogate some of that loss from them. So oftentimes what you'll see in policies is a waiver of subrogation, um, basically meaning that your insurance company is waiving the right to go after any other parties involved usually in that particular project um, for subrogation. So they wouldn't be able to, to use subrogation against them to get back any of that claim should you be found negligent. Additional insureds, um, I'm sure everybody's familiar with this. Uh, any project you're working on, everyone's generally asking for you to you know, send a certificate of insurance, get them added as an additional insured. So what is an additional insured actually? Well. It's a person or an organization that enjoys similar benefits to the insured, but it generally only pertains to certain activities for which that status is requested. Um, so when you're adding someone as an additional insured, it is basically kind of attaching them to your insurance policy, but only for that particular project. Um, you know, for instance, if you sign a contract with a general contractor to work on a project, add them on as an additional insured, it would only pertain to your operations there you know, other job sites, other scopes of work, other general contractors that you might be working for or owners, if you are a general contractor, it wouldn't, wouldn't carry over to those jobs. Hi, Chris, uh, we have a question here. Sure. Um, so the question is, subcontractors aren't always privy to the policies in place on the projects they work. They're just told that the COC is in place. How can subcontractors be sure they know exactly what deductible is in place? Yeah, absolutely. Great question. Um, that's what I referred to before that master policy. Um, so it, it is a little bit of an administrative uh, work on the subcontractor side of things. Uh, as you said, oftentimes it, this is being placed by the owner of the GC and the uh, um, subcontractor might not be privy to it. It is a matter of, you know, dealing with the general contractor or the owner, whoever had arranged that policy and requesting a copy of it. 
um, as I said, you do want to know what those warranties are and you do want to know what that deductible is. Um, is within your rights to, to request that. Um, so there should not be any issue with, uh, with getting that information. Uh, talk about a couple of construction specific coverages um, that we oftentimes kind of have a little bit of misunderstanding with. So we'll start off with contractors equipment. Scheduled versus miscellaneous are the, are the two types of contractors equipment. Now scheduled equipment uh, generally represents your larger pieces of equipment. Depending on the insurer, um, some insurers use a $3,000 kind of level, some use a $5,000 level, but it's Generally, your scheduled equipment is anything over that. Um, now, this would require information, you know, year, make, serial number, and the value of the equipment, as opposed to your miscellaneous contractor's equipment, which is anything under those levels. Um, you know, don't need as detailed of information. You just need to keep track of, of kind of a general level of how much you have overall. Now, a common misconception with uh, contractor's equipment is, is replacement costs versus actual cash value. So. Replacement cost, of course, is just as it sounds. It's it's replacing with, uh, with like kind or quality uh, up to the value that you have insured for that uh, particular piece of equipment. Basically, you're getting a new piece of equipment that is very similar to the one that you lost as opposed to actual cash value, which is basically a depreciated value for that equipment. Now, most policies in place, uh, it does vary by insurer, but as kind of a general rule, Three years is generally how long um, you'll get replacement cost value for your equipment. So the reason this is of concern is uh, I know a lot of clients, it is a burdensome task to kind of go through your renewal information and, and dig into each piece of equipment and kind of reassess the value of that. But it is something important to do. Um, replacement cost after three years changes to actual cash value. And you wanna be sure that, well, for one, you have the understanding that in the event of a loss to that equipment, you're not getting replacement cost, but also that you've reevaluated for depreciation, those pieces of equipment. Um, as you know, the way that uh, a contractor's equipment, that premium is calculated is obviously based off the value of the actual equipment. So ensuring that that is accurately valued can also save you a little bit of money in, in premium on your policy. And plus, Chris, I just have another question. Sure. Um, does hold harmless slash indemnity agreement always come from the GC or can a subcontractor put this in place also? Oops. Uh, yeah, a subcontractor can put that in place also. Uh, so that's the comment I made about uh, it can be one way or reciprocal. So it, it can go kind of from the GC to the subcontractor or vice versa. The last thing I wanted to touch on on uh, construction or uh, contractor's equipment, pardon me, is rented equipment. Um, there's definitely two kind of approaches to rented equipment. Some people when renting equipment like to purchase the insurance from the equipment provider, which is a totally viable option. Um, there is a, a, a place, I should say, for rented equipment in your insurance policy under contractor's equipment. Um, I find that the nice part about doing this is less of an administrative burden. You can set this up on an annual basis. And then every time that you're renting equipment, um, you know, you don't have to either purchase it from the equipment provider or kind of make your broker aware of the changes that are going on. Obviously the big consideration here is you set that amount um, based on the type of equipment that you're renting and kind of the maximum value exposure that you would be seeing. So things to take into consideration are, are the types and cost of equipment but also how many pieces of that equipment might you have on a job site? Um, a lot of people say, you know, we rent, uh, you know, a zoom boom and the maximum it cost is hundred thousand dollars. We want to set that limit at hundred thousand dollars, but you do have to take into consideration. I mean, maybe you're renting two or three of those types of pieces of equipment and they're all on the same job site would obviously be a, a catastrophic loss. If, if something were to go that wrong, that all of them were to be um, damaged or a total loss, but Something to keep in mind uh, on that exposure for sure. So earlier in the presentation, I mentioned an installation floater. So I wanna talk a little bit more about that. An installation floater is very similar to a COC, um, covers your labor and materials similar to a COC, but it's basically purchased on behalf of that company and it covers the work that they're doing. 
So a good example is, um, you know, as a contractor, if you're working on a project that does not have a COC, as I mentioned earlier, you can purchase and have in place your own installation floater, generally a, a part of your, your package policy, and it'll cover you for the same types of exposures as a COC would. So again, while well on the premises for installation, uh, while awaiting and during installation and testing, and in most cases, even in transit to the project site. So this is something that's a good consideration, you know, maybe to the question that we got earlier, you know, if you don't know what's in place on a project, again, I, I would would uh, urge you to, to find out if there is a seal, pardon me, a COC and, and how that, uh, how those limits are being done. But, you know, if you're working on a smaller scale project where there may not be a GC, um, you know, you may be the only subcontractor or contractor on that project in light or in lieu of purchasing a separate COC for that project, an installation floater is a very good um, kind of substitute. In most cases, as I said, these are included in your package policy. You use a determination of kind of what your, your average scope of work would be when setting up the limit for this. And it's something that just carries through all year. Um, there's no kind of reporting requirements um, if you're starting a new job, if it's part of your package policy. As long as the limits are within the scope of the project that you're working on, it's just something that you can proceed with for the entire year. Lastly, I want to talk a little bit about uh, pollution. So the two types of pollution are, are sudden and accidental, or what we sometimes refer to as limited. And the uh, uh, alternative to that is actually having a full pollution policy. So sudden and accidental pollution is most often an extension that's included in your package policy. But some of the drawbacks of that as opposed to having a full pollution policy are, there's generally lower limits provided when it's sudden and accidental, as well as the fact that in most cases, sudden and accidental will only cover you for five days for discovery. So that is kind of just as it sounds, if you're on a project and there is, you know, an issue, a, a pollutant that is released, if that pollutant is not discovered within five days, then sudden and accidental pollution policies in most cases actually will not provide any coverage. The alternative to that is a full pollution policy, which generally provides higher limits, as well as the fact that it covers you for the entire time that you have that policy in place. So it does not matter, you know, if it's a previous job that had been worked on, as long as you had a pollution policy in place during the time that that work was done, it doesn't matter when it's discovered, it will still be covered as long as it's within the guidelines of that policy. And something else I wanted to mention on pollution, um, and you know, a lot of contractors, depending on your scope of work, you know, may or may not feel that kind of pollution coverage is necessary. Um, I guess the main important thing to think about with pollution is kind of the def definition of pollution or a contaminant is, is anything that is basically in an area where it's not supposed to be. So, um, you know, theoretically and, and technically, I guess, uh, you know, a release of drinking water, you know, into a natural body of water that isn't treated um, can be considered pollution and there could be a claim there. So, there's a lot of, uh, you know, kind of claim scenarios where pollution is a factor. I think a lot of, um, you know, businesses and contractors kind of think, you know, maybe I don't have any heavy equipment, you know, there's no chance of, you know, hydraulic fluid leak or, or oil. So they're a little bit hesitant to maybe, you know, purchase a policy or, or go down that road. But, uh, you know, I would urge you to at the least kind of have some coverage under sudden and accidental. Um, but in best case scenario, look at getting a full pollution policy if you're doing any kind of um, contracting work. Taylor, I don't know if uh, if you, I still can't see the q and I'm sorry. I don't know if you have any other questions there or at this time, if anyone has anything else that they'd like addressed. It looks like we have one more question here. Um, someone is asking, can you speak to error and emissions insurance? Are there reasons the contractor would have to cover this or is this only something consultants and engineers would need to have in place? There can be scenarios where, where errors and emissions insurance is required for a contractor. Um, but generally it is something that only um, somebody providing professional services would need. Um, 
So speaking to, you know, construction insurance and errors and emissions, you know, obviously we would see our, our engineers and our architects um, carrying this at a much higher level. Um, generally for errors and emissions for a contractor, we see it added um, kind of as a, an extension to a policy at very low limits, um, but there's not very many kind of instances that the contractor would be exposed to that risk more so something obviously taken on by engineers and architects who would have you know, additional uh, significant coverage for that. Then we have another one here. It just says um, errors and emissions insurance required for design bills contractors. Yeah, similar to my answer before, it, it can be. Um, it's it, depending on the scope of work and um, who's providing kind of the engineering and the architectural services. Um, so that would be a little little tougher to answer without kind of knowing the exact scenario. But, um, you know, if a general contractor, let's say in this instance, is responsible for uh, you know, hiring the, the engineer, the architect, and um, they could, you know, purchase that for a specific project to kind of provide them with some protection, um, it should and, and generally would still fall on the engineer, the architect, um, or the professional to have their errors and emissions and it would most likely fall on that policy. Awesome, and then we have a question here. What is your experience with COC and wrap up on integrated project delivery models in terms of indemnity clauses? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I, have, uh, I have not had a ton of experience with, uh, with the integrated delivery model with using them. So I, I couldn't comment on that right now. Okay, and then another question here, how long do I have for sudden and accidental pollution? Um, so assuming that means how long do I have to, to make a claim? Um, again, going back to that example, it's generally in most policies five days. Um, so if that's not, um, whatever the pollutant um, contamination is not discovered within that five day period and reported to the insurer, then there's generally no coverage provided under sudden and accidental pollution. Can be a little bit different. You'd obviously want to refer to your specific policy wording if you have sudden and accidental coverage and it will tell you what the timeline is in there. As a general rule though, it's five days. All right, we have another question here. What does the current market look like for construction risks? Are the rates quite high, especially in 2020? Yeah. So uh, as a comment on the, the kind of general state of the insurance market, we are still definitely in what we call a hard market. Um, a hard market is characterized by um, a lot stricter underwriting, um, a lot of changing appetites for the insurers that we work with, um, of course, increases in rates and, uh, and premium. Uh, predictions uh, coming from industry sources are that we probably will remain in a hard market for another at least a year. Um, of course, that is just a prediction, can't, uh, can't know the future and what's going on. Um, but I can say this, that you know, knowing from our office, some of the other kind of industries and sectors, while the insurance company, or uh, sorry, the construction industry is experiencing increases, they're not nearly as bad as I guess some other industries and, and sectors. So you know, I can completely appreciate that obviously, you know, competition is fierce out there and, and margins are down and revenues are down. So seeing these increases in insurance premiums is, is not welcome and, uh, uh, you know, completely understand that. But as I said, they are, uh, you know, kind of on the lower end of the spectrum for some of the other industries.